Now for the main event. Presenters Jane Latimer, MA, is a longtime member of the PPS family. Jane is a psychedelic integration specialist with 40 plus years experience working with individuals with developmental trauma. She is the founder of Psy Alchemy. Her program is available for individuals interested in pursuing the use of psychedelics for spiritual, personal, and professional development. She trains individuals and therapists in best use practices for healing personal and collective trauma. She teaches an array of transformational models that when combined with transpersonal states and psychedelics can potentiate healing and spiritual collective evolution. Lisa Sherrill, MA, is a family therapist, executive leadership coach, mediator, and psychedelic integration specialist with 15 plus years working with individuals, couples, businesses, and groups dealing with gridlock, conflict, and trauma. Lisa's specialty is in the intersecting fields of attachment theory, neurobiology, addiction recovery, archetypal psychology, along with the study of relational interge intergenerational workplace and cultural trauma recovery. She is also in the process of getting her PhD in somatic psychology. So the format tonight is Jane and Lisa will present for, Jane will primarily present for about an hour and um, Lisa will be answering some questions too. And then we were, gonna, we're going to take questions from um, the audience. So as the uh, meetup progresses, if questions come up, just put it in the chat and we'll ask them to Jane and Lisa. So I'm gonna turn it over to Jane. Okay, wow, Donna, that was quite a mouthful. Thank you very much. <laughs> So uh, I want to, first of all, thank you all for showing up. I know that it's uh, not easy to come back on to a Zoom call if you've been probably on Zoom working all day. Um, and I want to encourage everybody here to please donate generously to PPS because they are an amazing organization and are supporting this event and many other events. And they've been doing it for a long, long time. Um, so if you can, I'm going to really encourage you. None of that money comes to me or Lisa. <clears throat> so it just goes directly into PPS for the events that they put on. And I want to thank Kazri very much for all the great work that she's doing behind the scenes. And of course, Donna, who's done a tremendous job of putting this event together. I am going to present, I'm going to talk pretty quickly. I have a lot of information, so I want you to get really comfortable, and we're just going to run through a bunch of slides. Feel free to throw your questions in at the chat. I'm going to, actually, I've been working with Lisa. Uh, we've been doing some um, partnerships together most recently, so I called her into this presentation pretty much last minute and said, Lisa, just handle the somatic piece and the relational piece, so we'll get to hear her um a bit more later so i love this i don't know where this drawing came from uh um but my partner sent it over my way and i think this is a beautiful way to begin so um many of us <laughs> maybe can relate to this and we start out here on the psych psychedelic process maybe we've been using it recreationally and then we want more here's me and lisa and we're coming together to do this presentation for you. The second presentation, so this, this one is a, is a major overview of six models of transformation that are submodels of these two, al two models, alchemical and holotropic, which we'll get into. I actually sent out some videos for you guys beforehand. I hope I didn't inundate people too much with those videos, but I think they give a good overview of the, the alchemical and the holotropic model. So when we get to that point, I will go through that very quickly for those of you who didn't see those videos. And then Lisa and I actually have a seventh. We have been working on a seventh model that does a beautiful job of actually interweaving 
these six um, or some of the six together. And so next month, when um, you, if you're interested and you want to come back, I hope you do. Uh, Lisa and I will do, a, it'll be less formal than this, but we'll be doing more of a dialoguing, which is what I think we do best. And we're going to bring in that seventh um, model for you. I want us to think about models as portals. So each of these models can be used as a portal into areas of personal and collective unconscious for healing and completing our life soul lessons. So more than a, a map, they are actually port portals. And each of the models, each of these portals has a safe and unsafe way to go about using them. Each has a particular function and a particular purpose. And as a rule of thumb, we want to think of going slower versus faster. Um, I did a presentation a while back on uh, powerful low dose journeys, and that was very much in alignment with this, um, this rule of thumb, which is to go slower and fast, slower is faster. And you will see as we go along that when we add some of these models to the framework of the way that we are utilizing psychedelics for our healing and our purpose, that there is there is an exponential increase in the power that happens on our, um, in our journeys. So each of these models that you're about to see is, can be used firstly as part of preparation, secondly, within the journey um, itself, especially if we're doing uh, lower doses and um, for integration. And of course, you will. Of course, some of them are not going to be able to be utilized. If, for example, you're, you know, you're in ceremony with ayahuasca down in, in, in South America. So it's going to be very much based on the set and setting and the purpose of your journey. All right. I want to give you a heads up beforehand. So this was a slide I was going to wrap up with, but I thought I'd like to give you ahead of time a little bit more of a taste of where we're going here. So we want to look at some of these modalities because they have been used traditionally already in the, in the world of psychology and in the world of spiritual development. So for example, somatic experiencing has been used as a discharge and repair, um, very slow work from the, from the nervous system. IFS has a method of um, utilizing, um, being able to identify protective defenses and then distinguishing those from the true self. Soul loss is done by a shaman. The concept of non-dual or wholeness is just a concept. Um, dimensions are really unheard of in most Western therapies, unless we are doing a past life um, type of experience with a hypnotherapist. And we are working with, we're learning to work with and repair attachment. And all of this is being used traditionally, but when we throw psychedelics into the mix, what happens somatically, all of a sudden, this discharge, the somatic discharge can come on rapidly, very quickly. We, in, instead of talking about the self or understanding conceptually the difference between self and protectors, we actually have an experience of that self um, with uh, soul loss, which might be done, for example, in a journey by a shaman. With the use of psychedelics, we are able to actually uh, do that soul retrieval ourselves or it comes in spontaneously. Um, instead of talking about mystical experiences or non-dual, we actually can have a mystical experience. And um, with, in terms of dimensional work, like past life, spontaneously, that will start to come in. And of course, the repair of attachment uh, and relational trauma that takes many, um, could take many months and many years of working with without medicines, especially with the use of MDMA, that kind of support can begin to come in very quickly. So that, that's where we're going with this presentation. So if you're here, that you will get something from this presentation, whether you are using psychedelics for the first time or just exploring the possibility. <clears throat> if you're a seasoned journeyer and you're, and you're really aching to be of service and be of, um, bring your lessons and your insights into the world, you will get a lot from this. If you're, also, if you're stuck in your process, um, if you're a mental health professional and you need to have support some of your clients who are using psychedelics in their healing process. And also, I want to say that if you are an individual who's preparing to become licensed as a psilocybin provider in the state of Oregon, 
and you want to upgrade your skills. This is going to be very, very useful for you. Uh, I just want to say at this point, I'm very proud to say that I have been invited to teach in one of the programs that, for that is licensing that will be starting in September. Um, that will be with Tom Eckert, and it's with the program called Intertrek. So I want you to just know about that, keep your eyes and ears open. So that will start to become available in September. All right, so tonight, why we need the models, we're gonna look at this overarching framework very quickly. Uh, we're gonna look at six transformational submodels. Uh, talk a little bit about when to use them and when not to use them. We're gonna start putting them together and look at some of the upcoming programs I've got going. Okay, so why stuck with the DMN? Let's just move on from this and we'll, we'll take the whys as they come. So. I want to use this word, I love this word, uh, Sarah Payton um, brought it to my attention in her book, um, Resonant Self. If you haven't seen that book, I highly recommend it. Savage DMN is talking about the default mode network that the ego gets stuck in and false ways of being, specific, specifically if we've had problems as children developmentally growing up, which is really where this presentation is aimed. And most of us have those problems as we will see. Um, the savage DMN is, is um, critical. We get stuck in suffering. We get, we get stuck in a limited conditioned idea of what reality is. is. Uh, we're not able to access a larger context. And we know that psychedelics can dissolve this savage DMN um, quickly and it can it, it can do it very thoroughly, but usually what I've seen with the, with the individuals that I work with is that it can, it comes, it can come back or the, D, the Savage DMN comes back quite quickly after a journey. So I started asking myself, okay, for, with, for my clients, what's gonna to begin to help them actually move um, and, and move forward and actually maintain and sustain some of the changes that are happening as they are doing their psychedelic work. We know in indigenous cultures, um, psychedelics are not um, used separate from the culture. So they are actually part of the culture. And in these cultures, for example, the shaman, for this is just one little example, okay? The shaman would tune in to the spirit of the inborn uh, child, baby, and that, that baby might be named after its actual sole purpose, okay? So we know that the plant medicines were used as part of this kind of global cosmology. So ancient cultures or indigenous cultures um, had already have a complex cosmology that includes spirit and includes plant medicines. And we don't have that. I wanted to read this um, quote from a modern uh, shaman, uh, shaman, and she, she's the uh, founder of the Light Song Shamanism School of the 21st century. And she says, I find as a shamanic practitioner in the United States is that there are many lost souls or wandering souls that haven't made it to the light. I personally feel that Western cultures with their hodgepodge belief systems create the scenario. And in indigenous cultures, there are very distinct belief systems that the entire tribe believes in and adheres to. This not only gives the soul a template to follow, but there is a collective power in that the entire tribe believes the same thing. This collective belief is like a rocket fuel to the soul for the transitioning person. So here she's talking about what happens at the, the moment of death and, and the power, the collective power of a belief system that holds souls as they're transitioning into beyond the veil. Uh, another very powerful quote from Don Oscar, who is um, a powerful shaman of the Pachacuti Mesa tradition. Some of you may know him. Um, he presents frequently through the shift network. And I found this in one of his presentations. The words we use, the words we use are powerful and the stories we abide by are the foundation of reality. So consciousness begets matter. 
It's all about awareness. Before anything existed, it was simply mind expanded dreaming consciousness. And out of that emerged form. So if we just take that in for a moment and think about that, think about where our consciousness is, where our conceptual framework is in this very moment. Okay, so let's imagine uh, we go to South America, Peru somewhere and our expectations are high and we're going down there for an ayahuasca ceremony. And we've been told that this is what will bring us into a greater awareness of um, light and cosmic consciousness. And we don't get what we hope for. And we definitely, we get eaten alive by mosquitoes. And then we come back to this. So, so that's one scenario. And I see this a lot in my work with individuals. Let's say, here's another scenario. And this next one is what happened to me. Um, you, you go to Peru, your expectations are high. You do get what you hope for and you get eaten alive by mosquitoes, which I did. And to prove it, here is my little, my, here's my shaman, Teo with the flute. Here's his, his clan. Here's some of my people eating in the background. So we're hanging out in the jungle and I did get what I hoped for and I got eaten alive by mosquitoes. I come back to this. I'm hoping you can see it. I'm gonna give you a little bit of a moment. So this is what we're up against. I love this picture. Uh, my partner also sent me this picture and I thought I just have to use it. We are a dissociated fragmented culture. Most of us don't have a sense of self or know who we really are and why we're here. This was my parents' generation, okay? I just want people to accept me for who I pretend to be. The world is falling apart. So we're dealing with what Thomas Hubel, if you don't already know him, he's a very um, powerful spiritual teacher who works with collective trauma. And he says that wherever there's trauma, there are frozen pockets of unawareness. So basically we are a culture of frozen unawareness. And I want us to think about that for a moment. So we living in this collective trauma of, of frozen awareness and we take a psychedelic because we've read a book or we've seen something on media and we've watched some of the clinical studies and all of a sudden we're up against a conflict between everything that we've conditioned to be and the core values of what's most important in our heart. So this is what this presentation is addressing. What do we do? What do we do about that? Come back here. What do we do? So first of all, we have to start bringing awareness and understanding into the mix, which is what this presentation is about. And we have to start bringing awareness into the frozen pockets of unawareness. And most of the time we're doing that on many levels. Somatically is a very important way to do it as well as spiritual process. We have to begin to see our personal suffering and what we're dealing with as part of a larger collective suffering so that we're not, we're not thinking we're in this alone. It's not just our personal journey. And we need to begin to apply a new cosmology that aligns with our new collective emerge of emerging paradigm. So I'm gonna propose this, this is mine. This is mine. This is what I've come up with over the years of all the work that I've been doing is I'm calling it, it's a cosmology of being. So you're welcome to take this on if you want, or you can leave it. 
and find something else that talks to you personally. All right. So the two overarching models, which I'm gonna go run through really briefly because there are four previous videos that talk about these, are alchemy. And uh, so here's what we'll do. We'll talk about alchemy first. The second one is the holotropic model. But I, want to, I want to give you the context for alchemy. So we start out here on this outer false self circle. Here she is. She thinks she knows who she is, but she wants to be accepted for that. And we talk about this is how we've been conditioned and what we've been conditioned into being, okay? And what we're wanting to, when we're wanting relief from our symptoms, relief from depression, relief from anxiety, we want to have better relationships. We want to be more successful. I mean, we want all those things in our life. We want to experience more happiness. Really what we're wanting is in here. This is really important. So we need to get from this outer circle into the center of the true nature. Okay, so this is what we're after, living in here. Um, many of us are hoping, I'm going to come back to this, that somehow or other we you know, do a ceremony, we, we go like, we go back, we go back, we go down to South America and we get this terrific in, injection of ceremony, ayahuasca, and we come back and somehow we're gonna be in here. This is where the problem is. So there are stages. There are stages that we have to go through as that outer layer starts to dissolve. Um, very briefly, and I wanna talk about these stages in terms of what I've actually seen as well. So the first stage is gonna be innocence. I wanna say that I have had, I can, I, I probably more, but right now off the top of my head, I can talk about two people that I have worked with who were very clearly in this innocent stage. And both of them spoke very clearly of being, this being one of their, if not their first lifetime on this planet. So the innocent stage may be covered over with conditioning, which of course it is going to be covered over with conditioning. But when the psychedelic is injected into the mix, this is what might show up. So one person actually started talking about, it's actually scary for me, um, started talking about this being their first incarnation. They coming from another planet. They knew exactly what planet, they knew exactly what their um, purpose for coming to this planet was. Um, I got a little bit scared and I thought that perhaps um, she was having a psychotic break. It turned out she was okay and she was not. But this was a very true experience of this innocent stage. The second person, something similar. She just knew that this was her first life on this planet. And her whole process was about the whole process of the psychedelic was to dissolve that outer layer so she could feel the innocence that she was. Okay, so if we are in this innocent phase, then our experience is gonna look very different than if we're down here in the red phase. So the red phase, so basically what's happening is the soul is maturing. So that's why we have younger souls and we have older souls. And we're moving from this innocent place, we get, challenged and we start going through falling apart and going through stages of despair or hopelessness. Um, we may be in there for years or for lifetimes. And so that's where we're seeing our dark night of the souls. That's where we're seeing uh, our depressions and our despair. Um, we may go through periods, we start to go through grief and regret for what we didn't have. And if we're able to stay with that and we don't try to push it away, we may come out of into the light blue where the spark of creativity begins, there begins to be a glimmer. And then we move into a brighter light that's within as we're discerning who we are and who we're not. And we move into um, a, a place of fermenting as this new being is coming into life. And then we're moved into action. So I wanna say that my first I'm a very old soul and my first MDMA journey took me from the yellow into the red. And my whole life I was trying to find my way and trying to find the action steps I was to take and I couldn't find it. So this is just an example of my psychedelic journey being extremely different than somebody who's in the innocent phase. My psychedelic journey, this MDMA journey took me right out of this place of 
of fermentation and knowing that there was something deep inside of myself that needed to get out and it helped me break through and move straight into the red phase. So where we are in terms of our development is going to determine very much what we're being given in our journeys. Okay. The shakedown is basically the rot. The black stage is happening. Everything's changing. The DMN is breaking up. We don't know who we are. Our values, beliefs, behaviors are shifting. Our relationship to nature, everything is changing. And we're beginning to live in the question more than we are in answers. So this is the magnum opus of our life, okay? How are you? How are you? How are you? Are you okay? Sure, I'm fine. And this enormous amount of energy behind in the shadow realm are driving us. Now, I want to take the second model, which is the holotropic model, again, giving credit to Stan Groff for this um, uh, amazing system and Tab Sparks. So here we are, we're living along the horizontal plane in our trance-like um, state, in enculturated state. And then we take a psychedelic and this is what begins to happen. So as, as you can see, the, the vertical line will begin to grow and grow and grow. And now we have a nice balance. So we're beginning to, we can function on the horizontal, we can function on the vertical. And then maybe as happened to me in my twenties, um, something out of balance begins to happen. So there's a whammy in the spiritual dimension and all of a sudden the spiritual vertical axis is greater and larger than the horizontal one. And that's where we start going into what um, Stan and Christina Groff called spiritual emergency. This is where, um, if we want to bring this to a mental health person who wasn't aware of what spiritual openings are about, this might be um, called a mental illness or a psychosis. Um, and I'm very happy that at that time in my 20s, I did not have anybody to talk to about what was happening to me. But, um, and so I came out of it pretty much unscathed. Okay, so let's look at the, the two models together. So we're, they're both going to the same place. They're both going to a holistic viewpoint of being in true nature. Um, that false self gets dissolved and we end up in the center with a nice, um, even horizontal vertical plane access. That's ideally where we want to end up. Um, so the culture is transitioning and where might it be going? Let's just talk about that because this is some of what is gonna fall apart. So instead of the power over system, this is very much a personal thing. So think about this, how this operates in your life, power over. All of a sudden we're not in charge. We're not the one in charge. We're not, um, we're not the one underneath, but we we're challenged now to become connected with and power with others. So that as I empower myself, I empower others. This is a very different model. We go from a rational linear to a broad overview and synthesis. We go from a state of planning and having to know what's gonna happen into the future into letting go with flexibility and flow. I'm just gonna skip down. So we might go from control to vulnerability or from manipulation to authentic communication, which is a very different way of being with ourselves and others in the world. Um, so those are some of the examples of what the kinds of shifts that we might begin to see happening. Um, so the three, the six models, I've, I've, nice, I've put them into this nice little neat package so that we can understand them a little bit better. Um, the psychological models over here, which are operating on this false self, so we're still living in this trance culture of normal and we're beginning to start working and this is beginning to dissolve. Uh, there are models, psychological models that we can use to support this place of dissolving. One of them is IFS, internal family systems. The other one is the relational model, which I'm gonna have Lisa talk about in a bit and the somatic model. And those three models are beautiful models of taking us in a gentle way, softening, opening, expanding, becoming more permeable so that we can allow more of this to show itself and reveal itself to us. On the other hand, we've got three spiritual models that we can utilize to help us jump more right into this vertical dimension of our being 
and understand and explore, expand out, explore unknowns or raise our vibrations. So we're not stuck in the muck of the conditioning of the trance. And we're actually able to leverage our spiritual being, being to support us through these changes. Okay. With that said, it's not that simple. So remember this little drawing. So everything that we um, put, everything that is in the center here, I'm going to show that to you in a minute. Um, everything that's in the way of getting into the center of our being is the shadow. And this is the, the picture of that. So yes, he says, these little innocent ones are so sweet. They say, yes, how are you? Are you okay? Yeah, I'm fine with this huge looming shadow piece that's driving the evolution forward. So actually what happens is we dissolve that outer layer of the false self. Okay, let's take a look. She, everything is together and working and except that, you know, it's not really working. And she goes into a crisis, like the crisis, the crisis, she goes from there to there, who am I? So as we begin to tumble into the center, everything that we put into shadow or we remove from our being has to be reclaimed. It has to be revisited. This is what makes the process difficult. That's why when some of us get go into journeys, we start facing very scary things or we start looking at demons, parts of ourselves that we've disowned. So again, on this model, it would look like this. So everything that is not on this horizontal line, okay, is gonna show up in the lower dimensional area of shadow or the upper dimensional area of shadow, which is going to look like this. So we might start um, becoming aware of the gods and goddesses, the archetypes, the fairies, the elves, the past lives, the capacities, Big piece of this is becoming aware of our put away gifts and capacities and talents, our psychic abilities. So all of that has been put into shadow in order to fit into this limited horizontal plane. If we go underneath it, we're going to be looking at things like hate and anger and greed and instinct, sexuality, even joy, which might not have been allowed, ugliness, stupidity, all that ugly stuff. We're going to look at the legacy burdens from our family. We're going to look at inherited trauma. That is all going to start to surface. And so the question is, will we make it through unscathed? And I say, no, we will not. We will not make it through unscathed. That is the belief of the beings in the innocent phase. Um, and it's not until we start facing the challenges that we begin to realize that things aren't as innocent as we thought they were. We start falling and plummeting into that black. So here we have again. So everything that's in the center now has to be faced, it's been disowned. And we can do that through each of these models, the psychological and the spiritual, but what's in the way. So what happens is this outer layer begins to dissolve. We start coming up against um, shame and fear. And this is really, really important to understand because this is a good thing because as we start, so here it is, so that false self is dissolved and now we're up against uh, our fear and our shame. That means we're on target. We're moving forward. We don't experience the fear and the shame when we are defended against um, this true being. Because the reason that we've put the stuff that we've disowned into the shadow is because we have tremendous fear and shame around it. Okay, so in this, this is very brief. I just want to show you. So if we're talking about the psychological, and we're using the IFS model, which I'm going to go into in a little bit. The parts of self that have been disowned, we work with those. So we're, we're dissolving the protective mechanisms and we're going inward and we are finding those parts that have been disowned. When we're doing relational work, the same thing is happening. If we're working with somebody who's skilled with relationship, but I'm going to have Lisa talk to you in a minute about this. 
um, we, are, we are going to start finding and discovering some of those disowned places. When we start working with somatically, the body will take us into some of those disowned places. On the spiritual side, the same thing is happening. So when we're working with shamanism, we may be bringing back disowned aspects of ourselves from very specific places. So that's what's called, we're, we're retrieving lost capacities or lost parts of ourselves. Um, if we're working metaphysically, we might be discovering that the part that we put into the shadow is our incredible creative power and our creative capacities. And we pretended that we're a victim. So, and, and in the dimensional realm, we may actually have to go into past lives or go into life between lives in order to get some of the soul lessons that we could not access from this life. And all that has been put into shadow as well. Okay. So basically where we're at here is that as um, we are expanding, we are going to run up against shame blocks or capacity um, for vertical dimension expansion. And as I mentioned, so this is some of what we might face. This is some of what might be in shadow love, our gifts and capacities, our inner power, or on the downside, our selfishness, we might have to meet that, our greed, our grief, our hate, and our rage. And all of this has to come forward. All right, so now we get to go right into the models. We have the internal family systems, the relational and the somatic on the psychological end and the shamanic metaphysical and dimensional on the spiritual end. Um, so I want to say, I want to say this because I think this is really important. And Lisa, you're going to get ready to be up in a, in a little bit. Um, what we need to keep in mind is this is a lifetime of work. So every time we add a new framework to the mix, we're actually expanding our capacity to not just hope for or think about being who we want to be, but actually embracing and becoming who we want to. So every time there's a step forward, there may be a need for a different framework. And that has happened very much, very many, all through my life, as I kept moving forward step by step, I needed to find a new framework to hold and expand what I know about myself as a being because the old framework didn't work anymore. Okay, so these are the three psychological frameworks that we're gonna talk about. This is IFS, which I'm gonna go into briefly. And by the way, the free course that follows this will have a little bit more in depth on these three models. Um, but let's just look at this for a second. So IFS, internal family systems, is made up of three major components, which is the self, which is what we're talking about, that center of the being. And then we have the parts that we put away into shadow, which we're calling the exiles, which internal family systems calls the exiles. And then we have the protective mechanisms of the ego that try to protect the baby and the child um, so that it could survive its conditioned trance enculturated family system, it created a bunch of protectors. What happens is that most of us confuse our protectors with who we are. So I love this because this it, here's this person and he's, he or she's being tormented by the protector's voices. They're running his life and finally gets to the point where he says, shut up, okay? And when that happens, when we wanna start turning those protect protectors off, we are offered the possibility of then looking for and embracing some of those exiles. And as we begin to embrace the exiles, the, the true self, the self will begin to expand. So this is basically um, a beautiful model, a beautiful model internal family systems to help us begin to separate the, um, the managers or the protectors of our life that are doing a good job to, to enable us to become successful, um, happy citizens of a trans-like culture, okay? And these um, exiles have been put away because dare you bring the exiles back in and the exiles have 
are have these other capacities and things that don't fit into what we know as known and we start bringing those in and we can start to create havoc unless we're working very slowly remember slow is faster and it's safer with all of these parts and we're able to begin integrating them in to our life so i just want to say one more thing before i hand this over to you lisa the um for my people that I work with um, as part of preparation for their journeys and um, you know whether they're again they're leaving the country or maybe they're going to be using something legal here or maybe they found an underground therapist to work with okay I always want to work with the protectors because I want the protectors to be on board for the psychedelic journey that is about to happen for them. Because unless the uh, protectors are in agreement and willing to take that on, um, it's gonna be a lot more difficult for the person to allow what they see to actually become integrated in their life. Because what will happen is those protectors will come back on board and slam the system back down because it's not safe to go in there. So this is where definitely um, slower is faster. All right, so that was IFS. And I wanna ask, and since Lisa is an amazing expert in this area, how might relational and somatic take us through shame and fear and help us access the disowned parts so that we can move into the center of our being? Let's let people know, how, how would you work with people with relational and somatic um, entryways? Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks, thanks, Jane. Hi, everyone. Um, so if we look at it from a, the cultural trance point of view, our culture is extremely dismissive to the body and extremely dismissive to relationship. Uh, the cultural trance is very much, very much focused on money, food, shelter is the source of survival, right? And status and performance is, is, is how you get, get places. And so when we come into this world, when we're born into this world, our souls, our beings, our bodies, are not used to that, that they, we are relational beings, we are relational souls, we have a relational body. And as a relational somatic organism coming into this very dismissive culture, what is that going to do? It's gonna do two things. We're relational as infants because we can't, we don't have our limbs to run and move and go get our food and water, et cetera we need relationship, we need attachment, we need to bond. We need to know that those on the outside are gonna be able to protect us and keep us safe and keep us fed and nurtured. Okay. That's why relationship is so important. It's essential, it's survival. Relationship is everything. And it's very much a deep somatic bodily impulse to reach, to connect, to love, to nurture, to be nurtured, to receive. That is so ingrained within us that it is as essential as breath, okay? Now, when we have, when we're infants and we come into the world with that, and we're open to that, and we expect that, but we're bombarded and hit up against the conditioning and the cultural trance that dismisses that, two things are going to happen. One is we're going to feel an extreme amount of annihilation terror, absolute fear going through our bones. Every morsel of us is going to feel that fear because what's, what's being heard by the infant is, my attachment needs, my needs for relationship are not going to be met on this world, in this world. And therefore my survival is at stake, right? The second piece is the cultural trance will project onto us that we need to be more like it. And in that way, there'll be a shame projected onto us that we will take on, that who we are in this relational sense is shameful and needs to be pushed aside and so we can merge with the collective, okay? So that, that type of conditioning needs to be removed and we need to actually move into a space of recognizing and sensing and feeling the fear and being able to kind of, um, I'd say decouple from the shame and move into that sense of being. And that can, we actually literally have to walk through the annihilation terror and feel it through the organism and feel like we're actually literally going to die. And in this process can be an incredibly crumbling and disorienting space. Okay, so Lisa, I just wanna, so I'm, I'm bringing up this slide, okay. So um, 
Well, why don't you talk a little bit so about the polyvagal theory and the importance of the nervous system for that resilient place? Uh, and also, so we're talking, you're talking about, so one model is the relational model, which starts here, right? With the mother child bond. And if we don't get that, the nervous system is going to go into hyper arousal. I'm just, okay, so I'm answering my own question for you, but I want you to talk about um, the attachment styles, just briefly, we're not going into in depth about attachment styles, but why that has to be part of the healing process. And it has to be considered in our journey space with whoever is with us, because it has a major piece of restoration that needs to happen. So talk to that a little bit. You want me to talk to uh, about the accommodations, and the attachment styles? And yeah. Strategies? And, yeah. 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 And not in depth, just a little bit about what that is and why that happens. Okay, so there is, if you're familiar with um, uh, attachment theory, what shows up is you can have uh, four basic attachment strategies that can show up in this culture that we're, we're kind of embedded within. One is called a dismissive, so, or it can be called an island. Um, sometimes it'll be called anxious avoidant. And these are individuals that are very self-sufficient. They can sometimes even look down on people who um, need relationship and they're like, I don't need that. And they sort of feel a sense of superiority to those that need relationship. Um, these sometimes can be folks that are very high performance folks. You've also got folks that can be what's referred to as clingy or ambivalent. They're, they need connection, they're desperate for it. They'll compromise anything to get it. And, but they often end up with people who will reject them and reject that attachment and the desire. So they end up in this ambivalence. So for example, you can have someone who has an ambivalent attachment style, who's really reaching to try to get the connection, but they're engaging with someone who has, is married. And so they'll never actually truly be able to get connected. And so you see that ambivalence, the desperation, the clinginess, but then they have to pull back because the other person's not available. So, so that, Lisa, talk a little bit about what happened. So underneath that, what's going on in the nervous system? Like, why does that happen? Because this is the avenue that people need to be aware of in terms of moving forward. Why does that happen underneath those styles? So it happens because of whatever the developmental trauma is. So if you've got, if you've got an extremely inconsistent caregiver that maybe um, was there for you inconsistently, you're going to end up having probably some level of, of ambivalence to you. You never know if it's gonna be there for you when you need it the most. Or let's say you have an extremely um, dismissive caregiver and that's how you were raised and they were always working, then you will probably be right. You probably will grow up and never expect connection and, mm -hmm. and never think it's gonna be showing up for you. So what's, to... gonna, so what's going to happen in that shadow place is crucial. As we go into that center, we're going to bite up against our attachment style. So as we go into that center of that being of who we are, we're going to butt up against that attachment style at some point along the journey. And we're going to have to face it. Right? Right. Okay. So just understanding because we cannot embrace the fullness of who we are without embracing relationship. Correct. Okay. Yep. I, this, so I just, this is a big piece of the healing and the reason why I'm emphasizing and punctuating. And by the way, just so people know, I'm, I'm cutting um, Lisa off a little bit because I just want to get through everything, but I also want you to know that we are going to do something next month specifically on this infantile in utero um, trauma that happens when we come in as a soul into a physical body and we do not receive the nurturing from the environment, which we cannot in this culture. We are split off from it. So every single soul that's being born into our cultural trance is up against a very basic underlying annihilation terror Okay, and it's intergenerational, and it's also um, um, soul soul based. So 
what we're talking about here is that the psychological model can take us into that if we follow somatically our bodies, because our bodies is where we hold that. But also if we follow relationship, if we follow the stream of following our relationships and see what's triggering us, we can start moving into the center, but we have to be willing to go through the shame and the fear, the annihilation terror. Okay, so I want to just say that Lisa is an expert in this, and I feel terrible, but I know we have only limited amount of time because she has so much to say, and we will be actually sending out some videos. So please do, if you want to receive them, they are highly worthwhile. Lisa goes into greater depth about this particular area of trauma. Um, so putting the psychological system together, uh, you want to begin disidentifying from those uh, protectors. You want to bring awareness into your body and the qualities of tension and relaxation. And we want to establish a relationship between ourselves and the exiles. So we're building that core center of strength. We're working with relationship and attachment triggers. And we're working somatically in the body. And all of that put together creates an environment that make it safe for us to go into some of the deepest woundings that we have. Okay, so these medicines, whether we're working with MDMA, 3MMC, cannabis, which can work with very young dis dissociation, psilocybin, all of these medicines have a place inside of working with this, whether we're working with relationship where MDMA is way more um, beneficial than, for example, a medicine like psilocybin or on a high dose where we're gonna dissociate or be so internal, we can't really work with uh, relationship. So each of these medicines has a way of working with these particular issues. And I'm gonna, so I wanna just move on quickly to some of these spiritual models so that we can understand those. And then we're gonna, we're gonna wrap up. I wanna give you a few examples and then we're gonna wrap up. So um, holotropically, um, let's see, where am I going with this? On, this? on the spiritual dimension, as this vertical line grows, we're going to start working with these models. So shamanically, metaphysically, and dimensionally. Okay, so IFS was more working on this relationally with the body, with um, infant trauma, uh, right along here. And then this, that will actually take us in and can take us in to some of these dimensional places. And this is where we want to align ourselves um, with our higher mind. So for me, I actually started working here vertically, but a lot of people don't. I know Lisa, you didn't, I don't think, or maybe you did, I shouldn't speak for you when we talked about that. Um, but we can start from either place, but here's the deal. When we're working with the spiritual models, we are learning that we are, um, we have access to source energy. We are larger than the physical bodies we came in with. So even if we're going through a wounding, an infant wounding, uh, we are, we can become aware that we are more than that, more than this personality. So that gives us the strength and the resilience and the internal resourcing to be able to face some of the deeper wounding, some of the deeper shadow stuff. So we're looking at things like energy. We're learning how to raise our vibration. We start working with spiritual allies. We can use the archetypes for our healing process. Um, we start understanding, this is a big piece for me, that my thoughts have powerful impact on my reality, that I am a creator of my reality, not a victim of it. Um, this is where we start working with laws of attraction, um, a path of service. And if we're in a particular tradition, we might then go deeper into some of the um, esoteric areas in those models. So whether it's Buddhism or Sufism or the Jewish renewal movement, mystical, contemplative, Christian. So we start moving more in that direction. Um, so sham shamanism, amazing work for understanding. Perhaps we can, um, we can begin separating ourselves from intrusive energies or attachment. That's not even ours to work with, or ours to work with. Um, this was a whole new concept for me at one point, 
psychopomp. So it's like, it holds the, the conceptual framework for what happens to us as we leave this body. So that it's not just a scary thing and we don't expect to go into darkness. We can start working with, uh, um, the, with the spirit allies, with the elemental allies. So, we speak, so we're not alone, we're not alone. And we can learn how to move between the lower and the upper worlds. We can begin to do soul retrievals and actually allow parts of our souls to come back, not just from this life. So like, yes, there's soul retrievals that as exiles, we need to retrieve on a psychological level, but there are also exiles that are caught in other dimensions and in other lives. And shamans traditionally know how to access those aspects of the lost soul and go to where they are. They may not be in this dimension, and help us retrieve them. But as we start working with these models in medicine, um, we can actually begin to work with this on our own. I mean, we, be, we can become our own shamans, so to speak. Here's just some of the different um, models of shamanism. I'm not gonna, you can see them here. There's a lot of them, there's a lot of them. And um, again, here's, the, we are introduced with new conceptual frameworks, which is so important. I remember um, introducing uh, some people to the concept of Aini. So Aini is a concept that we don't have in our culture of reciprocity, that what I receive from the earth, I give back to the earth. So this is a concept that comes out of the shamanic traditions. Again, the psychopomp, the traveling after death, what happens to the soul after death? Take it's very scary. I mean, that's why I think most in our trance, we cut off, we cut ourselves off from what's going to happen after death. We don't know because we haven't, it's not been part of our tradition. And that there's spiritual, there's beings in, there's spirit in all beings. And I want to say one of the most powerful concepts for me was that of soul stealing. For me to realize that I, that, that is common in the shamanistic per, um, perception that there's, yes, there's soul loss, but there's also soul stealing. And that helps to make sense of a lot of the wounds that we feel. Okay, I'm not, I don't need to go into this. I'm gonna skip ahead. So for metaphysical, we're looking at things like, who am I without my story? That's pretty scary. You know, what we think about, if I don't have a story of who I came in this world to be as, a, as an infant that grows up into adolescence and into adulthood, and if I let that story go, who am I? So this, the metaphysical perspective begins to address this, the sense of non-duality or sense of I am being, again, the cosmology of being. It starts to help us um, decipher the truth from the false. It starts to help us develop our higher mind so that we create a mind that can receive the higher frequency vehicle from soul that we are. And um, so the metaphysical model, yes. So here we go. So for example, we might see non-dual models like Adi Ashanti or Muji or models that we create our reality like law of attraction, which is Abraham Hicks or Joe Dispenza or Wayne Dyer. And in Theosophist is not as popular today, but it was when I was coming into this kind of work um, a few decades ago. And of course, then there's the higher mind, the science of mind, the unity church and the work of Byron Katie. So these are some of the models that we might look at for the metaphysical area. All right, and now let's like, lastly, let's look at the dimensional area. So this is where we start again, looking, where we start expanding into the concept of that I, as a soul, have a tra trajectory that goes before this life and after this life that I can actually consciously access if I choose. I can go into my parallel lives. I can go into um, other realms and other dimensions of my being, and I can learn lessons from those places, and I can bring the healing to some of those past lives, I had that experience where I can bring the healing that I'm experiencing in this life into a past life where I've actually worked with a past life aspect of myself that was waiting for this life to happen so she could heal. So there's all different ways that the healing can happen if we start allowing the dimensional realms in. Okay, and then we're looking here, we're looking at uh, books by all the books by Michael Newton. So you're looking at, he did have 7,000 case studies of people that he worked with, um, that he began tracking their, what they were experiencing under hypnosis in terms of their past lives or their future lives of the life between lives. He has a few books that I would highly recommend. 
And then there's Roger Walger, who's a Jungian, and he, he wrote Other Lives, Other Selves, and he brings in the somatic element in to the work with the dimensional element and um, quantum consciousness by Pete Walker, and he's um, more um, modern day. All right. So if we're interweaving these spiritual models, we've got cleansing and purifying. We can call back lost parts of ourselves. We can understand the laws of mind and how we create a reality. Um, we can begin working with the soul from the perspective of trauma that has impacted us before birth, during conception, during in utero, and then um, in on into the rest of our lives. So here we are bringing it all together. So with psychedelic work, all of what we talked about here can be perceived and experienced more easily. But I want to add, it needs powerful integration. And I want to add preparation. So knowing a better sense of who our protectors are, knowing how to work with the relationships in our life, knowing how to use our body to, to as an access or portal into other dimensions, um, how to... Um, leave the left brain into the right brain, how to bring holistic awareness uh, without effort. And again, to understand the other realms and the archetypes and the images that we're seeing and the feelings that we're experiencing and what happens through our body as we go through that. So this was the beginning. I started off with this. We don't need to do this again. I want to talk a little bit about where people get stuck because I think this will help us understand and then we'll be coming to a close. So I think one, here are some of the key places where people get stuck, false expectations. So we're stepping up thinking we're going to, we're going to start leaving that false trance self and, 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 and somehow take, do a journey and end up in the middle, in the center. And we, as we've seen, that is not usually what happens. Um, where I've also seen people get stuck is holding on to that false identity. There's, they're not ready to let the false identity go, and that should be honored. That false identity is in place because, as we've seen, it's covering up a huge amount of uh, annihilation terror. And unless there are certain things in place in one's life, good secure relationships or a good therapist that we're working with, um, uh, or we have enough resources to get ourselves back to some place of sanity, we don't want to let this false identity go. So people can get stuck here holding on to it, but because they need to do other work, they need to do relational work, or they need to do somatic work, or maybe they need to do spiritual work to begin to understand that they are not who this identity, they're actually bigger and larger than that. I see people get stuck in the wounded in the identity with their wounds so that the wound becomes who they are rather than understanding that the wound is something we move through so that we can access the ground of being the greatness of who we are. I see people get stuck in the somatic armoring. Again, very similar, except it's somatic to the holding on to false identities. So the somatic armoring where I'm not going to release the tension in my body because if I do, I don't know who I will be. I don't know what will become of me. So that somatic um, armory becomes very hardened and we hold on that way. I see people get stuck in belief systems that are sticky. So if I don't believe in past lives and I have a piece of my soul trapped in a past life, I cannot move through that piece. I will not heal that piece. So it, in, until I become exposed to this as a possibility, I've seen that happen. And when the person begins to open up to this as a possibility, then all of a sudden a magnitude of healing can begin to happen. Um, attachment style, which is going to be a big piece of what Lisa and I are going to do next month. If we, if we're not able to understand our attachment style, then there's going to be a huge layer of um, infantile trauma or in utero trauma that may need to be addressed that is being held underneath that attachment style that can't be found until that attachment style is worked with. I see people get stuck in operating in one arena, for example, only doing somatic work, only doing somatic work, only doing somatic work, or getting stuck in a mental area and going around and around a looping of mental. Um, 
I, another area where people get stuck is if they're ready to make a breakthrough into their being a source, into their self as spirit, is, and they're working with a guide or they're in a relationship or in their life, there's nobody mirroring that back to them. There's nobody understanding that who they are is source. They can get stuck here because they can't let that in because they won't be seen. Um, they won't be seen. Uh, I won't be seen as source. My mother didn't see me as source. I was never seen as source. How can I allow that part back into myself? Um, and then, of course, the limitation of the guide. So if the guide hasn't gone to where you need to go, then the guide won't see you where you are, whether that's a past life piece or whether that's a somatic piece or a, an attachment piece. We have to be seen and reflected in order for us to receive who we are. And then there is the fear of touch which I don't know if we really have, we have, it's, I don't know, we can, we can come back to that. But I think Lisa, you and I will do a lot with that one next month when we work with um, our presentation on embodied soul. So soul embodied, soul embodied. So there's a lot of peace around this that the, the uh, soul of the infant um, won't fully attach to the body because of lack of touch and act, act, lack of holding and lack of nurturing. And so the, the use of psychedelics to help rewire that nervous system and actually in the caring, um, in the caring container of someone who is very skillful at knowing how to work with touch is a huge gift and needs to be looked at um, and worked with. Okay. Um, I just want to say a few of these. So what I want to impress upon everybody there's a lot here there's a lot of models there's a lot of ways that when we start when we are presented with different frameworks there's an opening that can begin to happen so for example i've heard people say oh i didn't know i had trauma around nature it wasn't until nature became a part of the program it was encouraged then the person was able to go oh wait a minute i have a huge piece of trauma around my connection to nature or if dream work isn't brought into the mix, then maybe that person, maybe that person's exiled is trying to get attention through a dream work, but they never go into their dreams. So they, they can't connect with that exile. Or in, in my case, um, Ibogaine, you know, told me that I was stuck in an, in an attachment issue with my house. But all I was told by Ibogaine was that this was, um, this was stuck in my mind. And I didn't have any idea how to unstick it. And it wasn't until five years later when I started working with attachment that I realized, oh, this is a mirror of my attachment style. So it's like, I needed, I needed these models. Um, um, somebody said to me, I entered the other dimension. Oh, the more I go into my body, then the deeper my dimensional self becomes. Oh, I didn't realize I could call on a spirit ally to clear this dark thing. Right, or I'm learning the difference between my protectors and my true nature, and I'm learning to trust my inner guidance. Oh, okay, if nobody brought to mind the protectors or that, oh, the way you're living your life is out of a protector, we may not see that. We may think that's who we are. Or I rescued an exile from another planetary system, or, or I gave a protector a new job who's now actually supporting this shift and this change. So these are some of the things that I hear. Let's end here. So I just, here we're coming from here. Remember when, oh, when you wet your pants in second grade, I love this cartoon. Um, Jeff soon regretted buying a memory foam mattress. So we're, we're stuck in here with all the things. <laughs> memories and we don't know what to do with them and we hopefully will get to hear some form of cosmology of being and I think Donna you wanted me to mention some of the work that's coming up so this is what I love to do this is what I do so in my training programs I and and I've developed a few a couple well Lisa and I have developed a course called Soul Embodied which is this is a completely free it's short, these are little mini courses, but where you can go into greater depth around some of these models, the other courses, Models of Transformation, which is again, a little mini course. And um, there are all ways just to give you pieces of what's possible. And um, again, I feel like my role in this work as um, an integration specialist is really in the realm of preparation to pre give people new frameworks, new concepts so that they can begin opening and get out of the habitual responses 
um, that we tend to find ourselves in, in the trance. Uh, and if, you can go into my website, you can contact me if you want further information. Uh, the website is here, the Models of Transformation will take you to, I think, this course. Anyway, you can always just email me, and ask me, and I will lead you to the right place. And that's it. I'm going to stop sharing. All right. Alan, would you like to ask a question? Yes, thank you very much. Hello, Jane. Hi, Alan. Um, I have a question on your slide, um, Stages of Alchemy. You had colors associated, green, black, dark blue, light blue. Is that a literal um, connection with if the tonality of the vision is in that color? Mm -mm. No, That's I don't think, I don't believe so. And actually I got those colors from, oh God, I'm trying to remember, it was a Jungian, it was a very powerful presentation by a Jungian therapist. And he was the one that went through those stages with those particular colors. So I wouldn't take it literally, no. Okay. Yeah. And then the uh, tonality. So um, there's always talk about light. What about absence of light? So if, if I've been, if I got a message that says I am the light and I'm the absence of light. You got a message that you're the absence of light. Okay, oh, no, I oh. think that's really important, right? That you're the light in the absence of light, yeah. What did you make of it? I have my impression. Um, I wasn't afraid of it. Um, it just seemed like there was dark matter. There's a lot of things that are absence of light and it's just making, it's felt to me more of a balance. Mm -hmm. The tonality of the, the journeys were very dark on the darker side of things. So it's like twilight colors. Yeah. And that's that's it in a nutshell. Yeah, and I have, I know there's one particular system that I've become aware of um, that's connected with Sufism. And I know that they talk about the black, that black, that, that absence of light is being very powerful entryway into source. That, that's a quality of source energy. So that makes total sense to me, Alan, that you would have experienced it that way. Thank it's you. like that empty void space, right? Which is like, how rich is that? Yeah, this was more like when your eyes are closed in the darkness that you see behind your eyes, not a, not a black void, mm -hmm. but. Right. Yeah. But if you were able to go into that without stopping yourself, right? Yeah. Letting yourself move deeply into that, that quality of being I think that's beautiful. Thank you. And David, would you like to ask either Jane or Lisa a question, please? Yeah, um, for maybe either. So my question is, I don't, uh, what is, do you see spiritual bypassing kind of a dangerous thing with the medicine? Because some of the people I personally know that have used it, um, the medicine, kind of just have gone straight up to that spiritual level and they don't have that foundation. A lot of their behaviors just are, you know, are still, you know, out there and affecting other people. And I was curious if you can maybe speak on that, the dangers of that on using the medicine. Yeah, do you want to speak about that, Lisa, or shall I? Maybe you start and I'll fill in the gaps. Okay. Yeah, I think that's a really important place so a few things come to my mind around that um so that could easily be a split it's definitely a spiritual bypass where but it also may be needed for a particular time in our work because if we don't have access to that if we can't access that place through our body right? If we can't access it through our behaviors, and the only way we can access it is to split off from the body, then that's better than not accessing it all. But at the same time, we want to learn how to bring that spiritual source place down into embodiment. And that could take years. So for example, for me, my first encounter with the light in my early 20s was very psychotic, because I was split 
I was living a very dark life and I had a major awakening. And so I was living parallel, like these two dimensions. And if anybody had looked at me, they would have said I was psychotic or heard me talk because I couldn't embody it. But it was also the direction that I took. So it was the guiding post. It's what enabled me to keep going and do the work to bring that light down in through my embodiment. So yes, the answer is yes. And, and it's all good. It's where that person needs to be. And also to be when we start operating, when we bring into awareness these frames, the, the inner guidance system will direct us to the next thing. If they're doing harmful behavior, that's something else. Then they need to be called on that. So be, you know, anything that would be abusive or harmful to another person needs to be um, spoken of. If it's not harmful, that we need to trust our inner guidance and we need to trust where we're being led. That's my viewpoint. Lisa, do you want to add anything? Um, I just say that uh, so long as we live in this bypassed culture, we're in a little bit of a dissociated, we, we can't fully embody our reality because the, the culture in which we live in is not embodied. And so when we do take a psychedelic, um, we are gonna be a little bit in a, in a trance state. And so we do need to recognize the set and setting when we take it. And can we create a, a container when we take this medicine that uh, reminds us and mirrors back to us the embodiment that they're really looking for. And then we might get a shift in terms of that spiritual bypass and something might actually become more embodied. And so I've had experiences where if the set and setting isn't right, it's a complete spiritual bypass. And if the set and setting is right, then, then it takes better. And we have to recognize how important, and that's the relational piece. It's like we are in relationship to everything around us. And so we can be in a dissociative relationship or we can be in an embodied relationship. It's a great answer. Um, David and Teresa, did you have a question? Yes. Oh, yes. Hey, thank you, James. It's been wonderful. Uh, you, can you, uh, a little bit different kind of question, but can you comment about 3MMC versus MDMA? Um, it's something you've mentioned before, and it's, um, I'm wondering about, um, can you can Qualita compare? Qualitatively. Yeah, qualitatively um, compare, contrast those two in your work? When you're working. Um, okay, so all I'm going to say about it is, um, three MMC is going to have a lot more um, open-endedness. It's going to have a lot more variability. Um, so it's a little bit of a of a scarier substance to play around with. Um, I, I know I that they're using it more in Canada, for example. And so I went to a training in Canada and that's how come I discovered it and found it. Uh, Compared to MDMA, which is a little bit more stable. Yeah. So the thing about MDMA is that, you know, usually you're coming up and then you're coming down. With 3MMC, that down can take a long time and it can stay, you can stay more open. So I've heard stories of people staying more opened up for two or three days. Hmm. Um, I also know that it can take, it can take you into much deeper scare. I mean, I want to say scarier because unless the container, um, unless you really know what you're doing, it can take you into places that you might not otherwise want to go. Where MDMA typically has that really feel good thing connected with it, and it's, it feels usually safer. Um, and but 3MMC doesn't have that safety net as much. Thank you. Thank oh, like, you for that. like mushroom versus LSD. I don't know. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. And then um, Jane. Or Lisa, there's a question from Lux in the oh, chat. Man. What about mixing 3MMC with MDMA? Oh my God, just MDMA do your, with Oh my God, just do your research. Um, <laughs> just do your research and thoroughly. And, and like, why would you? So like, 
why would you? So I am big on um, low dosing. So what I find, so for example, with MDMA, you really can't low dose it. I mean, you can take, you know, 75 or whatever, right? And you can get a minimal dosage of it, but you can't do a microdose with it. With 3MMC, you can do a microdose. You can do a facilitator's dose. Um, and you can open up some very, so once you are experienced with these models that I've been talking about today, and you have really good secure attachment and you have a safe set and setting and you know how to navigate through dimensions and you know how to work somatically, then you can do a little facilitator, a little mini dose of something like 3MMC and go way out. So what happens is why would you combine MDM? I'm sorry, but it's only if you have you don't have the container, if you don't have the experience, then you need to like pull on these medicines and use them to do things that we would naturally be able to do if we learn how to begin working with ourselves in that way. So that's what Psyalchemy does. My program is it teaches people, and I have people say, wow, I took a little bit of medicine. It felt like it was a high dose, of course, because you had these other modalities that were we were using simultaneously as the medicine. The only reason we need high doses of these medicines is because we don't know how to work with ourselves. So that's the purpose of this. Of well, this. And, and he, he comes back to say, um, okay. uh, to possibly stabilize the three MMC. That's why you would mix them. Okay, so I don't know. That's all I'm gonna say. I, I don't know. I'm very, I'm just very, very careful with substances. And Lux, I didn't mean to offend you. I apologize. Um, you probably have more information about that than I do. So maybe you need to share. And you don't have, okay, that's fine. He, he doesn't want to. That, a great okay. question, Lux. And I was just laughing because I was ignorant to it um, the three MMC. So I, I did not know. Um, and then you have a question here, uh, Jane, okay. what is your perspective on I am ketamine? Oh, That's I cool. don't, I don't have one. I don't have enough experience with that yet. So as, so just so people know, my position, which I think I've, tried to make really clear. Um, even though I have done high doses in my life, my, I mean, I've done, I do not high dose. I do, I am not infatuated with medicine work. What I am fascinated with are these models of transformation that we can use to integrate the insights and the changes that we have on medicine into our lives. That's my passion is evolving our soul to where we are living on purpose, where we are living in the center of the true being. That is my, my, my passion. And so I don't follow all the medicine stuff because that's not my passion. Um, I, I need, I try to learn. So as new, as people come to me and they teach me about things and I might explore a little bit here and explore a little bit there because I want to keep up with what's happening and I want to know what my clients are doing and I want to help them. Um, but I am not seeking to understand the new medicines. I'm not seeking that. That's not what my purpose is. My purpose that I've been guided for is to help people use medicines very consciously in a way that supports their being evolving. So I'm going to, I'm saying that because I don't want anybody to ask me any more medicine questions, because if you ask me medicine questions, I'm going to say, I don't know. Got it. <laughs> okay, Donna. <laughs> Anyone else? I had a, one participant asked, um, what Lisa is going to talk about 
in um, her upcoming videos and what you're gonna, you talked a little bit about what you were gonna focus on in part two, Jane, but um, Lisa, can you talk about that? We're gonna look at basically relational trauma and which is a very sensitive and tender space. Um, looking at uh, infant and those formative years, so the first three years of life and the attachment that we have to our caregivers as well as the greater culture. And when we begin to understand and un understand that storyline, we can begin to start changing it. We start to understand our past in a different perspective so we can then self-author a, a new future. So we're looking at a lot of deep things related to um, inherited trauma, um, relational trauma, uh, womb trauma, conception trauma, and how the soul wants to come in and live this life and live this purpose and how it comes in through conception and then it takes on the cultural trance and how we can just how we can begin to decouple the soul's purpose and the clarity that the soul has from the cultural trance from the family trance and begin to kind of bring that light forward thank, thank you lisa um and will you also um is that also going to be talking about in conjunction with medicine work or is this just more of like Jane was saying as a complement to medicine work? Uh, the medicine work will be a tool to help us access it. Um, but it, but this will be just part of, I mean, it's going to be a tool, but that's how we're going to use it. So it'll be part of the container to support and understanding and, and going into it but it won't be the be all and end all. Great, thank you, Lisa. John, do you have a question? John Hawk? Uh, is that, Lisa, going to include um, overall perinatal um, experience or trauma, including birth trauma? Yep, we'll like even something as simple as a C-section can trigger an immense amount of disorientation for the infant, um, so perinatal, and prenatal trauma, all of that stuff um, we can explore. And uh, yeah, so definitely. Can I just add something? Because um, I really want to make it clear so it doesn't sound like I'm being hostile to medicine work. So what, what we're doing here is using medicines to access very deep unconscious places that the soul needs to go in order to evolve and that's the purpose that's what i'm good my viewpoint that's what cultures indigenous cultures have been doing that's how come they are able to live a full life as a part of nature and they didn't have the split off dissociated trance that we do. So we come to medicine work trying to fix a symptom and we don't understand that it's about reclaiming the self. That's where you know, indigenous cultures start and that cosmology that they bring forth. And so, it's, it's, we're not living, it's, it's not in service to the medicine. The medicine is in service to our evolution as a soul. And so when Lisa's talking about the process isn't a psychedelic process, but the psychedelic in the right psychedelic, in the right set and setting with the right amount, just the right amount can open up that whole realm of unconscious conception in utero birth trauma that we have to face in order to bring ourselves into alignment with our being. So I just wanted to add that. I'll just add one more thing to that, Jane, is we have to recognize um, that there is the self that's embodied the individual self, but then there's also the family self and the community self. And, and that we're needing to hold all of these three things. So if we are evolving the self, but, our, but those that we're interacting with 
is staying the same, our external reality is the same, but we're expecting us to change and nothing on the outside change, it's not gonna work. And so, um, and that's what, sometimes when we take a psychedelic and we take too much or it's not the right dose or become dependent, we go into a spiritual override, is to, it's an attempt to get to these places that we wanna go without actually changing our reality. And so we want enough to begin to create the shift, begin to get out of the false self, access some of these deeper dimensions. And then, and then there's that aspect of manifestation or creative action where we begin to take cha create change to, to embody the soul that is our individual within our own skin, but embody the soul that is our community, our family, our friends, and, and from the inside out, recreate our culture. Is what we're doing at a bigger level. Yeah, and very intentional and integration. I, Jane and I spoke a little bit about the, this too, about using psychedelics in the Western world where it's, it's not normally supported by the community, you know, and to, to um, integrate it with where we are in, in you know, ordinary states. Um, there's another question here from Keith, and, and he says, can you define your use of the word cosmology? Yeah, I saw that question. That's a great que question. And that's, um, um, so when I think of cosmology, I'm thinking of the whole world the whole world view or the whole paradigm that we're operating under. Um, that's multidimensional in nature. So it's our connection, it's, it's at the basic level, it's our connection to source and the soul and the trajectories of the, everything that we've been through and everything that we're here to learn and do. And it's a framework that gives that meaning. We don't have that framework. We have the framework of materialism, the framework of the trance. Until that begins to fall apart, we don't have a framework. So basically cosmology is a framework that in, that's big enough, big enough to hold all of us, all of the dimension, dimensions of our being. That's what I mean by cosmology, a framework to hold that's big enough to hold all the dimensions of our being, where our life makes sense and has meaning within that context. I hope that answers it. Bridget, did you wanna ask Jane or Lisa this question or both? Um, <clears throat> sure, and you know, I know this is probably um, a pretty big question, so um, just maybe a general overview of uh, how we could use these models um, to help us with integration. Thank you. Um, you want to tackle that, Lisa? We're like reading each other's mind. Okay, so I guess what I've experienced with the clients that I work with is um, they take a medicine, they get cracked open, they see what's underneath the false self, and they're a mess and um, they've got one or two options. They can move back into, they, they pick themselves up like Humpty Dumpty and try to patch themselves back together and move forward. And, but then it doesn't go very far or they're, they're in that state of chaos and things are fragmenting, the false self is moving away. And so then we have to move into integration integration meaning moving into the whole self that being within that Jane talks about and so we use six or seven different models to support integration and what's happening is we're actually integrating different parts of the nervous system and brain right so different models that some of the models that brain or that Jane talked about will do left right hemisphere integration some of them will do brainstem upper kind of cortical or upper higher functioning parts of the brain integration, hippocampus integration, you know, prefrontal cortex integration. So what shows up is as you, in, once you fall apart and we start to bring integration to the whole system, you begin to touch into and start to feel that whole self 
and it's not as fragmented anymore. It doesn't fall apart anymore. And that's why integration work is just so absolutely essential because you, it's just more than just cracking open the system. We've got to actually rebuild it from the inside out. And I'll add one more piece to the integration, which I think is so important. So you've got integration within the mind or within the nervous system and brain, but you've got integration within your relationships, integration within your family, integration within your community. And that's, that's part of it. So there's, the ins, there's within the skin and there's the skin and in relationship to others. And that's why the relational piece is so, so, so essential. Thank, Thank you. you. I'd like to add something to what Lisa said. Um, and I think that's a really good question about, it's like when we really ask ourselves, what is integration? So in the example of we, something gets broken through, right? And then whatever in our life isn't working. Okay, so we start with we, something's not working and we're driven to, to utilize a medicine to help us break through, understand that and why it's not working. But everything in our life is a reflection or a mirror. So if it's not working, then there's a something internal. So that is also, the alchemical model. It's what is below is above. What's above is below. What's outside is inside. So as we're looking at what's not working, these symptoms are holding the essence. They're holding the trapped energy of who it is that we're wanting to become. So every time we step into a new insight and we see something about ourselves, this is an opportunity to then integrate that new insight into a new way of being, which then will automatically change the external circumstance. So sometimes we may, so we may be in a very stuck place, let's say in a relationship or in our career, and we do a medicine and we get a big insight around it until we're able to integrate and understand what is inside of me that is creating that, we, it won't really change. Because it's, everything out there is a reflection of what's in here. And that is basically the metaphysical model. So when we understand that, that we can use all of our symptoms as a way in to insight deeper into ourself to find what is stuck in our own self that's creating the stuckness in our life. That's the integration process. I love that Lisa gave it a neuro, neurobiological slant. Um, yeah, psycho-spiritual integration is absolutely, that's exactly what we're talking about. That's what this whole presentation has been is the importance of including all of it and that we can't bypass the relational. We can't bypass the somatic levels. We can't bypass um, the spiritual levels and expect to become whole. Like it has to be psycho-spiritual altogether. So I'm not sure what, Alan, you're I'm seeing the question. I'm not sure if I'm understanding it correctly if that's what you meant or not yeah it basically i was struggling with your definition sounding much of it sounds like regular counseling or, or therapy and when we talk about you know, internal family systems we talk about somatic we talk about these other things but it just i, I wanted to be clear clarify for myself that it was both those aspects the, the spiritual and the psychological, um, which you were talking about, which is different than traditional modalities. Exactly. I'm very glad you, you clarified that because if that wasn't clear, though, that was a major miss on my end. So everything that I presented is not either or, it's not one or the other, it is yes and. All right. All right. Thank you. 
and is and in, and in, that's the problem with the trance and psychological in the psychological arena which the mental health field that's why people get caught and stuck in you know spiritual emergencies because they're the mental health field in our culture is in the trance as well. And so that's not including the spiritual aspect that needs and has to be included for the whole being to be healthy and experience well being and to experience oneself on purpose and in alignment with one's reason and purpose for being here. That's what it's about. We all have a being that has a purpose for being on this planet. And until we know it and we feel it from the inside, we will feel unrest and we will not feel right. And the only way to access that is through all six of those modalities. Um, I have a follow-up question to Jane, what you just spoke about. Um, I'm thinking about, well, I'm wondering if, if um, you know, by extension, that would mean that, uh, any type of therapy, psychodynamic therapy, any therapy that doesn't involve relational aspects, somatic work, internal family systems, any, any of those types of therapies, then would you just say are part of the trance and they're not really actually going to be moving, moving us in the right direction? Okay, that's, that's a really good question too. Um, these are really great questions, you guys, because these are making me think about things that I otherwise wouldn't have thought about. Like, what do I mean by cosmology? You know, that was a great question. This is a great question. I would say that yes to no. I would say that there is an inner guidance system that is always operating. So if we use that holotropic model and we are being led to a cognitive behavioral form of therapy, then that is what is being needed at the time. And it could be that that aspect of the trance, that there is also a trance aspect to that, but that that's okay. So it's like, that's what's needed. So it's really more about trusting the inner internal guidance system of where it's taking us and learning to trust that guidance then it is about any particular modality so what we're doing here is bringing awareness as don oscar said in that very beginning quote who we are starts with a framework or a concept and then it becomes form so if the only concept we have is is the mental concept or behavioral concept. That's a good concept too. That's a concept. That helped me at, so access shifting thoughts from one to another, shifting a negative thought to a positive thought. I had to learn that skill. That was an important part of my process. I wouldn't have been ready to step into something bigger or scarier than that if I hadn't already learned how to do that. So that's why it's like, there's nothing that's being negated here except for my, except for my ability to know the ins and outs of all medicines. That's the only thing <laughs> other, than, other than that, there's nothing being negated here. Um, because it's all part of us learning the resourcing. As we become more aware, then our resourcing expands or our capacity expands. And we go, oh, I mastered that now. I know how to change a negative thought to a positive thought. Then maybe I can expand into something more. Does that, I'm hoping that helps, Jill. Yeah, absolutely. And just thinking about my journey and how I came to medicine work it it makes sense that um yeah those other forms do move us in a direction maybe to like for me it did lead me to the knowledge of of medicine work and so yeah yeah thank you for your response 
Well, in that case, I will do a little more housekeeping and uh, you guys have the links to donate. PayPal, Venmo, credit or debit. Jane and Lisa came here uh, graciously of their, um, to volunteer and put on this um, presentation for us. And Lisa's coming from back east. And uh, if anyone wants to unmute and say thank you to either one of them, please feel free or put it in the chat. It's always <laughs> nice to hear. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Really informative. Thank you all for showing up. Wonderful. Wonderful. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. Thanks so much. Thank you all. Thank you for coming. There's also a uh, link to a, um, a survey. If you'd like to tell us what you liked and didn't like, there's a link to the survey in the chat. But thank, thank you for presenting. Oh, yeah, that would be great. And the one in April is going to be very different because it'll be more of, of Lisa and I having a conversation, which when we get into, re when we start talking, we go into really deep stuff. So it's going to be a lot more spontaneous. It's not going to be a slideshow. I mean, there may be a few slides that we need to bring into it, but it's going to be spontaneity on the cuff that will go really deep. It's not going to be for the light of heart. Amen. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.